As soon as we arrive at the entrance to the mine, we find two chests, one containing a resurrection piece and the other a turtle orb, a rune that blocks status effects when it's equipped. Oh, and the beaver. A really cool beaver who's racist. We enter the mine shaft and push a mine cart to clear our way. The enemies here are, for the most part, souped up versions of those we fought in the underground complex back in Stormfist. You know, the slugs that poison you and birds. The birds? They aren't too difficult, though we do have to actually watch our health and heal up when people get low. Log and Lun are useful enough here, but are well below those we've been using in our party up to this point. This is mostly because they enter our party at a lower level than everyone else, and we can't upgrade their weapons yet. Still, the two do have a useful co-op attack that deals damage to every enemy in a row. It's worth noting that Log becomes stunned after using it, however, which means he is unable to act in the next round. This part of the mine is pretty linear, though we can go out of our way to find a martial arts garb, a decent armor piece for either us or Leon. On the way, we can find a chest containing a sound set. Much like Windows sets, this lets us change certain assets of the game, in this case, the sound effects. We can't use it until we find a phonologist, however. Finally, we find a Mother Earth piece before moving on to the next area in the mine. Leon and Lun are startled to find people living down here, but Log explains he's had a lot of dealings with the cave dwarves living in this mine. I guess you could say Log knows people in low places. There's one particular dwarf that Log is trying to see, so we go off to explore the camp to find him. The camp is small, but actually has most of the vendors in any other town, though we can't use the blacksmith right now. We spend most of our parch on snazzy new armor before going off to find a skull cap, a helmet that we steal right in front of this poor man. Most of the dwarves here are surprisingly friendly, but don't have anything terribly interesting to say, so we hit up a ladder. Hey! Gunny! Are you here? Don't call me Gunny. This is Cunny, uh, uh, Gundy. He's an old friend of Log's and an expert miner. At first, he doesn't believe Lun is Log's daughter, but mm, Lun gets rid of that doubt. Before Law can even really explain what we're doing, Gundy is eager to break into the prison. Apparently, that was how the two met. They were fugitive smugglers. Log explains that the two of them would break into prison, usually helping to free gladiators. They were able to break into Agate Prison once, and the secret tunnel they built should still be there. With Gundy in tow, we enter the second part of Baskin Mine, also known as Hell. Like, literal, actual Hell. Alright, it's not that bad, but this is by far the biggest dungeon area so far. But there's only one way to go. Oh, there are tons of diverging paths, but all of them are dead ends. Nothing awaits us there. No treasure chests, just more random encounters. It wouldn't be so frustrating if this was the only time we needed to come here, but that's a secret. Also, the place we actually do have to go also looks like a dead end. First time I played this, I saw this wall, thought it was another fucking dead end, and ran all the way back through multiple times. Luckily, I know where to go now. So Cunny digs us a hole. We arrive in the basement of Agate Prison, where Gundy says his farewells. This trip through Agate Prison is a fairly short one, with the enemies being the same as those in the mine, as well as a few Godwin soldiers. As we move through the offices here, we pick up a military uniform, a decent piece of light body armor, and a guard ring, a defensive accessory. We continue through the prison until we come across a heavily guarded door. Damn it! How did intruders get in here? Protect Lady Merces at any cost. You got it. Huh? You will not pass. Like other boss battles so far where we just fight a bunch of schmucks, this one isn't too difficult. 
The two soldiers in the back go down with any bit of AoE, though the two ones that are, well, obviously more important, have a good deal more health. Log goes down here, but eh, he'll be fine. Interestingly enough, right after we beat his ass, one of the prison guards calls us Godwin scum and accuses us of coming to slay Lady Merced. The female guard in particular seems very protective of this person they're supposedly imprisoning. We explain who we are and why we're here. The guard with an alarmingly flat face believes us and tells us his name is Seus. The woman's name is Lilay and the other two are guards A and B, I guess. He explains that, though they are her guards, they never agreed with Lady Mercedes' imprisonment. Furthermore, the two have formed a relationship with her and have become more her protectors than her guards at this point. He also illuminates more on Mercedes' imprisonment. Turns out that Lord Godwin actually ordered the execution of the tactician, but Queen Arstadt was able to simply have her imprisoned. Lilay is still skeptical of our claims and refuses to let us see her lady. But Leon offers her sword to the guard and tells her to strike her down should they do anything suspicious. This seems to connect with Lilay, as Leon says it's not just her job to guard us, but also our intentions. Lady Mercedes, may we please come in? Enter. We've brought His Royal Highness, the Prince. Thank you, Lilay. Anything for you, my lady. Uh, you're Lady Merces? That is correct. Lucretia Merces. Your Royal Highness, Leon, people of Raflik, I have been waiting for you. Waiting for us? How did you know we were coming? Well, I... I didn't really know, but I was waiting for you all the same. I am a prisoner here. However, thanks to Seuss and Lillet, I have some understanding of the situation outside. That is why I thought somebody would be coming for me soon. I was not sure whether it was someone who wanted to use my expertise, or someone who wished to slay me. But now I see, the prince himself came to rescue me. I am quite honored and humble, just like a princess in a fairy tale. Uh, huh? I welcome you, please. Will you not sit down and make yourselves comfortable? Lucretia accepts our proposition before we can even make it. She's already deduced that we would need a tactician to help us navigate the political waters. The one caveat she has is actually one for us. She tells us that she was the one who advised our mother to don the sun room. During the Lord Lake Rebellion, Lucretia learned that Lord Godwin intended to use the chaos of the situation to steal the sun room. Putting things together, it now makes a lot more sense why Arstadt not only took on the rune, but also used it in such an extreme manner. Her punishment of Lord Lake was almost certainly a consequence of her donning the rune without yet knowing of its influence. Still, it could very well be that the only way to ensure the safety of the room was to take it on. It's a pretty nuanced situation. Lucretia also laments the effect it had on Sialides, who she feels blames her for Arstadt's mental decline. Finally, Lucretia reveals that she was actually Lord Godwin's advisor when all this went down, not the Queen's as we were led to believe, which is why he wanted her execution. She warns us that this shows that if she feels we are headed down the wrong path, she'll follow her own morality rather than loyalty to us. Doesn't really matter what choice we say here, really, but she seems pretty smart and we need all the help we can get, so we decide to take her along. She also asks us to accept Seus and Lilay into our following as well, so they come along too.
With that, we move to escape the prison, though the rest of the guards are not as friendly with Lucretia as these two. Speaking of Lucretia, she can't be used in normal battles. She's one of my favorite characters in this game, but her only utility for the game part is in army battles where she provides a decent ability to our squad. Seas and Lele, however, can be used in battle. First, we'll cover Seas, and, well, he's not the greatest. Pretty much all his stats, other than health and attack, are low, and even then, they're pretty middling. He's terrible at magic, has low accuracy. I guess he's kind of meant to be a tank? He can wear heavy armor, which is nice, but we're honestly better off using the Prince or Leon, who have the technique to parry fairly consistently. Uh, Seas doesn't. Lele fares a little better, though not really because of her stats. She has much better magic, but not enough to compensate for being short-ranged. She does have access to a special skill, however, called Analyze. As you can probably tell, when we're in battle with Lele, we can see enemy health bars. This is really convenient! Not worth using a subpar character in my opinion, but it can certainly help make decisions. Seas and Lele have a co-op attack called Lockdown, which deals a fair amount of damage to one enemy. It's not really worth it, but if you like guards, go ahead and use these two, I guess. We decide to make our escape by going through the front door this time, with Lucretia noting that Rathfleet could very well be in danger. She says we don't have time to elaborate on that premonition, however, and urges us to make haste. Seas and Lele trick the guards at the dock by telling them an intruder was spotted in the prison and they have to move the prisoners by boat. The two guards are pretty dumb, so they run inside, making the coast clear for us to come and steal a ship. On our way back, the party spots a fleet of warships. Lucretia tells us that this is likely the fleet of Barum Luger and assumes they're heading to Rathfleet. Log and Lun rightly freak out, but Lucretia maintains a calm demeanor and says she can handle it. After a long traveling cutscene, we finally make our way back to the river town. When we arrive, we're stopped by a couple of sailors who believe we're Godwins, since we are riding a Godwin boat, after all. We explain who we are, and Lucretia urges us to meet with Raja. We head to the Dahaka to find that Silees and George have already arrived. Lucretia introduces herself to George and Kisara since she's already acquainted with Silees and Raja. George says he was planning on breaking the tactician out himself, but couldn't find a way in. He thinks it's funny we were able to do so. Uh, really funny. Raja and Kisara start explaining the situation, telling us that Barum's fleet arrived and demanded their allegiance to Queen Limsleia or they would be subjugated by force. Raja also mentions that Barum Luger was actually her student when she was head of the Felanian Navy. She knows he's very capable and that Rathfleet doesn't stand a chance against the Godwin forces. Still, she refuses to bend the knee, but doesn't have a plan on how to defeat them. Lucretia says she does, but there's a snag, and that snag is us. Lucretia is our tactician, so we have to give the order to help out in this case. Choosing to think about it just delays the story. We gotta be a good boy and help out. Lucretia's first plan of action for us is to close sluice gates that are controlled by the Barrows. Silead says that they can probably ask Lucerina to do so. And with that, it's off to war! Yep, it's another army battle, but as you can probably tell, our unit names have changed! That's because I lied, this isn't an army battle, it's a naval battle! Naval battles are... army battles. They just take place on the water. The primary differences are the units and abilities we have access to. There's still a rock-paper-scissors element, but this time we have combat ships, which beat ramming ships, which beat archer ships, which beat combat ships. We also have the Dahaka in this fight, which functions the same as an archer ship, but much more powerful. Again, we really don't have enough characters yet to make any meaningful decisions in this setup phase. We can really just pick to take Cornelio with us or not. And he's actually pretty useful, giving an ability that improves the speed of the ship he's on. We see that Barum moments having to go against Raja, but feels that Godwin's way of unifying Felena is required. We also see that the Barrows have sent reinforcements, with Boz and some of his men showing up eager for battle. Lucretia tells them to hold his forces back at first, however. 
Barham begins to notice the river's water level going down as the sluice gates were closed off by Lucerina. He tells his men to continue forward regardless. At the start of this fight, we want to listen to Lucretia's advice and just not move. Let them come to us, because when they do, some of their ships begin to run aground. Now, this isn't because Barham was stupid so much as he was ignorant. His ships didn't hit the riverbed, but the wreckage of a dam that Lord Barrows tried to build in the area. This dam was torn apart in the Lord Lake Revolt as their forces moved north to the East Palace. Our smaller ships can still maneuver through this wreckage, but three of Barham's battleships are effectively neutralized. Our goal here is not to actually destroy every ship, as once Barham's two remaining ships are sunk or his own ship takes enough damage, he will retreat. Still, you get more rewards for sinking the other two ships, so it's better to do that. Well, I tried to do that anyway. Somehow, I got Log and Lund's ship stuck on the sandbar with Barham going after them. Every time they'd retreat, they'd just go right back into Barham's attack range. Thankfully, they have the ability to heal themselves so they didn't sink, but I did miss out on the extra items. It's not too big a deal though, and with that, we successfully fend off the Godwin forces. We reconvene on the Dahaka, now joined once more with Rathfleet as a whole. Raja and Kisara thank us and Lucretia for our aid. Acknowledging that without our help they would surely have been dominated by the Godwins, they inform us that Rathfleet is now ready to devote itself wholly to being our ally. We recruit Raja and Kisara, and even though the game doesn't say it here, Lun and Log become full-fledged party members as well. That's not all, however, as there's one more character we can recruit in Rathfleet at this time. We head to the item shop and find a merchant who thanks us for fighting off the Godwins. He says the Godwins would be stifling to trade, and, well, trade is what he does. He tells us his name is Shinro and joins us! Yep, that's all we needed to do. If only they could all be so easy. As we leave Rathfleet, we cut to a scene with Gazelle and his father. The two are talking about Lucretia joining us. Gazelle seems worried about it, but Marshgale tells him that Lucretia isn't to be trusted and will end up betraying us eventually. They're interrupted by a general called Dilbert, uh, Dilber Novum. The three discuss Barham's failure, with Marshgale and Dilber chalking it up to Barham's attachment to Raja. Dilber has no such attachment, however, and is being sent to Rainwall directly to take us down. Back in Rainwall, Salem has already heard of our victory and congratulates us. He gives some overly enthusiastic praise for Lucretia and laments about her imprisonment. Lucretia reminds him that it was our orders that saved Rathfleet and that all are here to support our cause. He agrees? It's a very laughter-filled conversation. Back in our room, the party remarks how obviously disingenuous Salem is. Lucretia says that's just how politics go, but does bring up a matter she's been perturbed by. In the Lord Lake Uprising, the rebels had to go through Barrow's territory to get to their Dawn Room. The story is that their soldiers were overwhelmed, but Lucretia suspects there might be more to it. Finding out the truth of the matter becomes our next goal, but it would be difficult for the party to find anything without Salem catching wind of it. Lucretia suggests we employ the help of a private detective, one by the name of Oboro in particular. Oboro's detective agency actually operates out of a boat, so it's possible he's docked in Rainwall. Kisar is familiar with the detective and offers to have Log and Lund negotiate. Lucretia insists that Oboro is a very important potential ally and suggests we go to see him personally. We set off to find Oboro and we see a scene of Psyleads and Lucretia speaking together. Psyleads asks if the tactician is only helping us to make amends for what she did to Arstadt. Lucretia still feels she offered the best course of action with this Unruh, and insists that she is only helping us because it's the right thing to do. Psyleads admits that she still hates Lucretia, but feels better with her at our side. Before we continue, let's go over our new friends. First is Raja, who's only available to use in naval battles. There, however, she commands the Dahaka, the most powerful ship for the majority of the game. Like Lucretia, most of her contributions are through the story and not the gameplay. Shinro is our first support character. He cannot be used in battle, but if we bring him along, he lets us use an item shop wherever we want. Useful for keeping our inventory clear by selling stuff we don't need. In major battles, he gives us an extra ability usage to whatever unit he's attached to. Finally, the Rathfleet family. 
Log is all about brute force. He's not going to hit often or quickly, but when he does hit, he'll hit hard. He can also take a beating, though this is mostly due to his high health rather than defenses. His medium range makes him a little better at dealing damage than tanking it since he doesn't have the best accuracy already and lowering it further by putting him on the front line can make him just a meat wall. Still, he's simple but effective. Kisara has big boobs. There, I said it. It's out. It's out there, I can't ignore it. Okay, she is well endowed. Kisara can be described as Cornelio, but better. Unfortunately, the niche that Cornelio and her hold isn't terribly useful. She's a short-range mage, though with better health and attack than our well-endowed conductor. She attacks with a rope that can hit surprisingly hard for a mage, but not hard enough to really compensate for being short-range. Still, she is a decent mage early on, and with an S and incantation can be a decent healer if you're going for a short-range heavy party, for some reason. Lun is like a mix between Log and Kisara, appropriate since she's their daughter. She can best be compared to the Prince in Leon, as she's very versatile with an even mix of stats and a medium ranged weapon. Of the three, I usually find more use for Lun since she can fit on pretty much any party, though is certainly less effective than us or Leon. Her signature skill, Pierce, lets her normal attack sometimes hit a column of enemies. I'd rather have the option to use another skill, but it's decent enough. If you have all three party members in your party, you can get access to the Family Attack Co-op skill. This does a decent amount of damage to every enemy, but stuns Log for a turn. We head to the docks to see if our detective is docked there, and what a coincidence he is! Or at least these people are. A man and a woman sit at a table. The woman asks if we're a client, and the man is... Well, a jerk. Who smokes? This cool hombre is apparently Shigure, according to another woman who enters to chastise him. This woman recognizes us in Leon, though no one will let Leon correct her about Leon being an apprentice rather than a fully fledged Queen's Knight. We learn that the woman sitting down is called Sagiri, while the only person who seems to want to help us here is named Fuyo. Fuyo is the administrator and accountant for the detective agency, while Sagiri and Shigure are investigators. Fuyo is more interested in talking at us than to us at the moment, so we learn that she was actually a client of Oboro before working with him. Finally, Sagiri tells us that Oboro is an inn at the moment and that we should return later to ask for his services. Also, Shiguri hits on Leon because nyeh. So what must we do to have the enigmatic detective return? We must leave Rainwall and go back in, then go back to his boat and he's there now. This is Oboro, detective and creator of the business card, apparently. We explain that we want him to investigate the Lord Lake Uprising, specifically Salimbero's doings during it. Surprisingly, he readily accepts, with even Fuyo proclaiming doubt that they can figure out anything on such an old event. Oboro is confident, however, and the case is on. We head outside his office, where Oboro wakes up his two investigators. He tells us that he'll have a report ready for us as soon as possible. As we leave, Leon becomes distracted by something, but brushes it off. This is actually the start of an optional side quest. We don't have to complete it, but it does help a lot with recruiting certain characters later on. Instead of returning to the mansion, we swing by the local inn. There we talk to a drunk who makes fun of our clothes. We then leave the inn to be stopped by Sagiri and Shigure. Shigure is mad at us for messing with his investigation. Sagiri is actually reasonable and explains that the drunk's name is Norden, and he was the Barrow's vice captain at the time of the uprising. Norden starts to come out, prompting us and the investigators to hide. The drunk stumbles out, but the interesting part is a shady character follows him and gives the obvious ellipses to signify his shadiness. The two investigators say they should follow, which gives us the choice on going with them. There will be a couple of these choices where we can follow up on the investigation or not, and selecting to not a single time will end the side quest, so we just have to keep being curious. We head back to the docks where we eavesdrop on Norden and the shady character. The Man of Shade questions Norden on why he was talking to us, the Prince. Norden is still quite inebriated and still doesn't really believe that we were the Prince. The man tells Norden to cut back as the drink is loosening his lips a little too much, even going so far as to threaten his life. 
Shigure says we need to follow the man, but Oboro stops us and says that won't be necessary. He explains that he already has a way of finding out where he went. That way is apparently a mouse? Oboro talks, question mark, to the mouse, which then runs off. We chase after it. The mouse leads us to a garden near the Barrow's mansion. Oboro explains that the mouse is one of his best investigators, which actually doesn't explain anything, but whatever, the man can talk to mice, I guess. The group heads back to Oboro's office, now knowing for certain that someone connected to the Barrows is threatening Norden into silence over something. Oboro asks us once more if we wish to continue the investigation with him, to which we say yes. Oboro says that we should put on disguises so as to not be noticed by any Barrows men. Perfect. So by dressing in the exact same way we were dressed when we first came to Rainwall, we cannot possibly be recognized and go talk to Norden once more. This choice here is actually one that will end the side quest if we ask him how the booze tastes. Yeah, there's a couple of those choices in this game. Oboro asks Norden about Lord Lake outright, which the drunk initially refuses to talk about. Oboro mentions he knows the Barrows are keeping an eye on him, and that makes Norden more compliant, and he agrees to come to the office. He still refuses to tell us anything, however, even if we were to torture him. Oboro states that they do not torture anyone to get their information, but tells Shiguri to get the boat ready for departure. We have to say that we're taking him there to continue, even though we don't know what there is and the game doesn't tell you. The hint here is that Oboro tells you that seeing is believing, and also that we then warp to the pier log took us to get to Lord Lake. So yeah, we go to Lord Lake. Norden is obviously distraught at seeing the devastation of Lord Lake and yells that we can't blame him for this. Oboro and company really push the idea of guilt onto Norden, telling him they know that's why he drinks so much. They say the only way for Norden to clear his conscience is to tell them all about the situation. Norden says he needs time to think, so we head back to the pier. There, we're stopped by some Barrow's soldiers before we can leave. The soldiers say they saw us snooping around the mansion and have come to demand we stop our investigation or else. Like every other time we've been threatened, violence is the answer, so we get in a fight. Like other mob fights like this, the Barrow's soldiers are pretty easy. You can actually use Shigure and Shigiri here, who are pretty overleveled, making it even easier. I choose not to, but if you have any AoE spell at all, you can mop these guys up pretty quick. After knocking the soldiers out, the party returns to Rainwall in Oboro's office. At this point, Norden has sobered up and expresses remorse for getting us mixed up in his troubles. He seems much more open to talking now, but says he still needs some time to gather his thoughts. Oboro says we can return to our duties and he will deliver Norden's testimony when he's ready. And with that, we've completed this case. Investigation complete. Case closed. Uh, I don't know how to end this episode, but I have to end it here, because... <laughs>